While there are many ways that a twin screw extruder can be designed, most in use today are either co-rotating, fully intermeshing compounding extruders, or counter-rotating, fully intermeshing pipe and profile extruders. There are two types of counter-rotating extruders, parallel and conical. The screws of a parallel extruder have the same diameter from end to end, while the screws of a conical extruder change in size, growing larger toward the feed end. A twin screw extruder looks simple and rugged, but it is a complex machine that can be easily damaged. To simplify this complex machine, we'll break down the extruder into five systems and look at them separately. These systems are drive, feed, screws and barrel, the adapter and die, and the control system. Because there are similarities as well as differences between co-rotating and counter-rotating extruders, we will make it clear which one is being talked about. The drive system consists of an electric motor that is coupled, either directly or indirectly, to a gearbox that has two output shafts along with a thrust bearing for each screw and couplings that connect to the screws. The motor is equipped with a variable speed drive that must accurately control the RPM, or revolutions per minute, of the screws from a slow crawl to full speed. Most machines have a mechanical overload coupling between the motor and gearbox. Many different types of motors and speed controls are in use, with the choice being based on accuracy, cost, maintenance, and horsepower requirements. The gearbox reduces the motor's speed and multiplies its torque or twisting force. The motor may turn as fast as 3600 revolutions per minute, while screw speed may range from 30 RPM in a low speed profile or pipe extruder to 1800 RPM in a high speed compounding extruder. The gearbox is strongly built and will operate without much attention if the oil is kept clean and is not allowed to overheat. Some operators are responsible for checking the oil and the oil temperature, a task that must be performed as scheduled. On some extruders, the motor is connected to the gearbox by belts. It may be possible to operate the extruder without the guards in place. This must never be done. Behind each screw there is a thrust bearing, whose job is to prevent backward movement of the screws when there is pressure in the melt. There can be a great deal of force acting to push the screws back. In a 3.5 inch or 90 millimeter profile extruder operating at 3,000 pounds per square inch of melt pressure, there is a force of nearly 13 tons trying to push each screw out of the back of the extruder. Thrust bearings are designed for a certain lifespan at a specified load, and their life can be cut in half by a 25% overload. This is one reason that the melt pressure must never be allowed to exceed safe limits. Nearly all twin screw extruders are star fed, although the feed flights may be just filled in some pipe and profile extrusion. In star feeding, the amount of material entering the extruder is set by how much is delivered by one or more feeders. Each feeder must deliver a smooth, steady flow of material, both to provide a consistent rate of output and to ensure that the proportions of the ingredients remain the same. In addition, the flow of material into the extruder must not be restricted in any way, a problem that can occur if the materials must pass through a pipe or duct after being measured out by the feeder. Feeders are normally equipped with a hopper and material flows from the hopper to the conveying section. Gravimetric, or loss in weight feeders, deliver material by weight, constantly checking the amount being delivered against the setting. Volumetric feeders run at a set speed, so if there is any variation in the amount of material that flows from the hopper down to the belt, screws, or auger, the output of the feeder will vary. Gravimetric feeders can sound an alarm if their output changes, but volumetric feeders cannot. Feeding problems can include bridging, funneling, and separation of the ingredients. In bridging, fluffy, soft, or sticky materials that do not flow easily may form a bridge at the bottom of the hopper. The flow may stop completely, or the bridge may break up and later form again. Funneling is also caused by materials that do not flow easily, although it may be made worse by a hopper whose sides make less than a 60 degree angle. The material along the side stops flowing, and the material in the center feeds until there is a hole or tunnel through the center of the hopper. The feed may then stop, or the tunnel may collapse and then form again. 
Either way, the rate of feed to the extruder will not be consistent. There is another problem that affects feeding when the material that is being fed is a powder. A great deal of air is present in the material as it enters the extruder, and most of the air is squeezed out by the screws and flows back out through a vent below the feeder. It should not be allowed to flow back through the feeder and hopper because it can cause changes in the weight of material that is entering the extruder. Melting, also called fusion, should be nearly but not fully complete before the material leaves the compression section and enters the vent section. Insufficient fusion will allow powder to enter the vacuum system, while complete fusion will interfere with the removal of gas and vapor at the vent. In either type of machine, trapped air from the feed and gases or vapors from additives must be removed from the plastic before it enters the die. Venting is done by releasing the pressure on the melt, usually with vacuum applied, while constantly mixing the material. Any bubbles in the material will expand and break as they come to the surface, releasing the gaseous material. Co-rotating compounding extruders often have several vents. Whenever the processing conditions permit material to move into the vent section at a faster rate than it is conveyed out, material may flow out of the vent. This is vent flow, vent flooding, or some other descriptive term. In counter-rotating extruders, high melt pressure ahead of the screws is one cause, especially if the screws are worn, but there are many others. In co-rotating extruders, vent flow can be related to the screw design, screw wear, feed rate, screw RPM, and other factors. When the barrel, adapter, and die have reached their set temperature, wait for the required length of time before starting the drive. Never attempt to start the screws if there is any unmelted plastic in the extruder or die. Many newer extruders have a soak timer, which prevents the screw drive from starting until a preset time has passed after the temperatures have risen to their set points. As soon as it is safe to do so, start the drive at the specified speed and start the feed. In compounding, start only the main polymer feed. Don't let the extruder run empty for more than a short time because it causes rapid wear on the screws. As plastic flows into the extruder, watch the drive amps or percent load as well as the melt pressure gauge. If either one exceeds the normal startup value, find out why. Do not let it go because there may be a problem. If the motor amps or percent load are normal and the pressure is within safe limits, allow the screws to turn at the speed shown in the instructions. During this time, do not permit anyone to get in front of the die for any reason because hot gas and plastic could spray from the die. Once plastic is flowing from the die, gradually increase the screw speed. You may be required to let it run at some lower speed until the material is flowing smoothly from the die. If smoke, black material, streaks, or snapping or popping sounds continue, there may be a problem. If they clear up in the normal amount of time, thread up the line and start the downstream equipment if it is not already running. As soon as possible, bring the line up to production speed and closely monitor both the process and the product. Because it may take a large extruder as long as two hours to achieve consistent temperatures, continue to monitor closely until the process is stabilized. Don't make changes to the settings unless you are certain the process has stabilized, unless those changes are part of the procedure. Take the readings that are called for by the standard operating procedures or operator instructions and check them against the run sheet or setup sheet. 